reception that will take place later at uh, around 5 30 or so and we're going have some, something to eat and discuss all right uh, so uh, thanks for inviting me this is the first in-person talk i've given since the pandemic has begun um, so the main purpose, um, or one of the main purposes of this talk today will be to explain in the context of celestial holography uh, how symmetries constrain and to what extent they determine uh, the terms of an operator product expansion. And uh, what I'll be saying today is uh, based on uh, this a paper that appeared uh, in August that I wrote with two collaborators, Mina Hemwich, who's a graduate student at Harvard, and Kyle Singh, who's an um, undergraduate at UPenn. And uh, some similar results were also found by Hong Wong Jung and appear in his paper. Okay. So to begin, uh, let me remind you that celestial holography is a proposed duality between uh, quantum gravity and four-dimensional asymptotically fast spacetimes and uh, conformal field theories in two dimensions. And uh, one of the basic observations underlying this proposal is simply that the Lorentz group uh, in four dimensions, SO3, comma one, is isomorphic to SL2C, which is the global conformal group of theories in two dimensions. And this implies that if you study scattering amplitudes for 4D particles in highest weight representations of SL2C, then they will transform under Lorentz transformations like correlation functions of primary operators. Now, of course, if we want to have a meaningful holographic correspondence, we need more than just that. But the relevant point for now is that those are the natural objects to study to develop and test this proposal. And uh, those objects are called celestial amplitudes. So to gain a feeling for particles in these highest weight representations, let's recall the labeling of ordinary primary objects. So they're labeled by a point on uh, the 2D plane and by the left and right conformal weights. And under SL2C, this point undergoes Lewis transformations, A, B, C, and D. If you put them in a matrix, or an element of S L C C. And primary operators diagonalize the two transformations that preserve the point C, Z bar. And so in particular, the eigenvalue, so the two transformations are a dilation about that point, and the eigenvalue of that is delta, which is the sum of the two conformal weights. And there's also rotations about the point C. The eigenvalue there is n, which is the difference of left and right conformal weights. Now, if we want to interpret this pair of conformal transformations as Lorentz transformations in 4D, well, it has to be the case that they map to a pair of mutually commuting uh, Lorentz transformations. And so therefore, they have to map to a boost along and rotation about some particular direction. And so what this means is we're going to be interested in single particle states that diagonalize these two transformations. And for massless particles, there's actually a very simple way to construct such states. And so the reason why it's simple here is because we're used to studying helicity eigenstates, and these diagonalize rotations about the direction of a null momentum. And moreover, in studying these, it's useful to label them by spinner helicity variables. So that is, we parameterize some null momentum in terms of a pair of two component vectors. And these are nice because they transform non-trivially under this transformation. So in particular, they transform by these phases, which means that so they transform non-trivially, but they're, of course, uh, these, they're eigenvectors of this particular transformation. And so note in particular that the, the part of this two-component vector that's left invariant under this transformation is the ratio. 
which means we should identify this ratio as parametrizing the direction of the null momentum. Now, under a more general under a more general Lorentz transformation, these transform by acting with this matrix, where this matrix M is this matrix here. And then you can uh, readily see that this ratio, in fact, transforms just like the coordinate on the plane, and therefore we should label it as such. And so this motivates that we, in fact, further parameterize this null momentum in terms of points on a 2D plane, and we need a third variable, so I'm going to call that omega. So uh, the upshot is that we can label massless particles and momentum and felicity eigenstates by four numbers, where these two can be interpreted as coordinates on a 2D plane. This is the eigenvalue uh, under rotations about the direction of the null momentum. And this is characterizing the overall scale of the null momentum. And so it's basically an energy. And so if we compare the labeling of these states with the labeling of primary operators, we know that apart from this omega, we have a precise match. And so uh, just to verify that this is in fact, omega cannot be identified with this parameter delta, uh, note that under a Lorentz transformation, omega transforms uh, trivially and uh, delta is invariant. So they cannot be identified with one another. And this is just to say that, uh, so another way to, to, to see why this actually had to be the case is that basically I argued that uh, states which transform in high state representations of SL2C are going to diagonalize um, a boost, in other words, they're going to be boost eigenstates, and boosts don't preserve null momentum. So in fact, it's impossible to work with uh, momentum eigenstates of null of massless particles that are also in these high space states. But nevertheless, uh, we can easily construct them. And uh, the way to see that is that we've already diagonalized this rotation about P. So uh, the easiest thing to do is now just diagonalize a boost along the direction of P. And so in particular, under such a boost, the null momentum transforms by some overall scale, which means that these variables are all left invariant except for omega. And this particular rescaling is diagonalized by an integral transformation known as the Mellon transformation. So that's this. These are an example of states that transform in highest weight representations of SLTC. And so the upshot is that if you take uh, an amplitude for mass of particle <laughs> momentum space, you Mellon transform it with respect to the energy of each particle, then you're going to obtain an object that transforms under Lorentz transformations like, correlation like a correlation function of primary operators. And uh, as I mentioned before, these things are called celestial amplitudes. So a couple comments. Uh, this construction I just described is uh, not systematic. And so in fact, uh, this is not the unique way to obtain uh, highest weight representations from momentum space. However, uh, this class of states will be the focus of the talk today. And the reason is, is that they have this key property where the points on the two dimensional plane um, are, actu are actually correspond to points um, on the spatial cross section of null infinity. And the basic reasoning uh, for that is that it simply follows from the fact uh, that this C was uh, actually labeling the direction of these null momentum. I want to understand why you said it's not unique. So here you are solving the wave equation, right? And you are selecting, you are diagonalizing some generators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but so the. Uh, it's not unique because I can provide an example of another set, and that is that I can perform a shadow transformation 
um, on this guy. So I can uh, non-local transformation on Z and Z bar and obtain a state uh, with weight, uh, one minus H and one minus H bar. And so that's just another class of wave functions that satisfy these properties. And so there's at least those. Okay. I guess there is a notion, the notion of incoming and outgoing protocols. Is that also? Uh, yes, I have not discussed that yet, but um, uh, essentially, yeah, so that amounts to adding, you know, a sign here. Yeah. Okay, so the immediate implication of studying uh, this type of space is that, so, I'm going to suggestively represent these type of states by operators. Is that there's a if you take two of these operators, close to one another, well, that's dual to limit in which uh, the two null momentum become uh, uh, collinear. And just the easy way to see that is that you can compute the inner product in these variables, so these kind of velocity variables, like this, and in our energies and points in the sphere. And so, in a standard conformal field theory, we know that this particular limit is governed by an operator product expansion. And so, uh, that means that if we want to interpret these uh, boost weight states as local operators, then it needs to be the case that collinear uh, limits essentially emit an OPE like structure. And uh, encouragingly, the collinear limits of uh, tree level massless scattering amplitudes do appear to emit uh, a compatible structure. So, to investigate that limit, what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, Z and Z bar to be independent variables as opposed to complex conjugates of one another. And this is the bulk interpretation of working in 2 2 signature as opposed to 3 comma 1. And then working at tree level, we're going to ask the question what is the most singular term? in Z12 that can appear in a scattering amplitude. Now, if we're working at tree level, singular terms are only going to appear from propagators, and something like this is only going to appear from a propagator involving those two momenta. So, And these types of propagators only arise from diagrams where particles one and two couple the rest of the diagram. So now, as we take the limit that Z12 goes to zero, well, this propagator goes on shell and the diagram factorizes. So in particular, in the collinear limit, it's an amplitude, and we take this limit, then we find the three point interaction. propagator and uh, an amplitude in which the pair of particles have been replaced by their. So now, if we take this um, three-point interaction to arise from a bulk operator of scaling dimension dB, then this V3 will scale like energy dB minus three, the propagator will carry two powers of energy. I said we're interested in this leading term as Z12 goes to zero. And I argue that the most leading term is going to be just a simple pole. And there's going to be some Z bar dependence. And so I'm going to write that as some undetermined power. And so what this implies is now if we uh what this impl uh, statement implies 
for celestial amplitudes constructed in this way is that, so I'm going to write them as a pair of, as in terms of, or suggestively like a correlation function, is that if we have a pair of operators, we take this limit, then, so the Mellon transform doesn't touch this Z, Z, Z dependence, so it just pulls out. And these two operators get replaced by a third operator. And here I have determined the scaling dimension of this operator essentially by counting powers of energy. So basically the Mellon transform for each of these will contribute a factor of delta one and delta two respectively. And then this collinear splitting function contributes a factor of dB uh, minus five. And so uh, the basic idea is that you want to interpret this, or we want to interpret this as arising from an operator product expansion. Some okay. like this. And here. Minus delta and now, if we compare the transformation of both of these sides under SL2C, well, uh, then we find that, you know, in particular, that implies that the net uh, delta dependence on both sides has to equal one another. And so, matching the net, net delta dependence, we find this P minus four. And likewise, the net spin dependence also needs to match. And um, calculating that, you find it's also equal to S1 plus S2 minus S. And if we did this uh, argument that I just sketched more carefully and you know, actually you know, found the form of this uh, interaction and so on, we could have explicitly just calculated this OP function. However, instead, today what we're going to do is we're going to provide a holographic first principles derivation of this OP coefficient from symmetry. And so specifically, uh, we're going to show how Poincaré symmetry uh, determines this uh, leading OP coefficient for uh, uh, particles of any combination of spins. Now, as an aside, for those of you who are familiar with uh, momentum space or properties of momentum space scattering amplitudes, uh, this may not seem very impressive because it's well known that Poincaré, in fact, uniquely fixes three point function between uh, massless particles and fixed helicity up to an overall coupling constant. And as we just saw, this uh, the three point uh, function is sort of the, the key piece in this collinear limit. <clears throat> Now, it turns out that actually the three-point amplitudes uh, in this particular basis are not smooth functions of the coordinates uh, on the plane. And so it made uh, directly implementing this analysis like not, from total, not totally clear. Um, but, but moreover, I think maybe the value of what I'm gonna to present today is that it shows how 40 particles, which are irreducible representations of Poincaré, emerge from the two-dimensional CFT data. So um, in particular, let me point out that a massless particle in four dimensions is really represented by a family of operators of fixed uh, spin and varying uh, delta, which is the 4D blue spin. Now, operator product expansions uh, involve primaries of fixed boost weight. And so therefore the grouping of boost weights into uh, four dimensional particles is captured by a non-trivial dependence of the OP coefficients on the boost weights of the primaries. And so our goal will be to determine this delta. And the basic logic is that 
uh, translations in four dimensions are actually going to uh, relate different conformal families and thereby impose further constraints uh, on the OP coefficients of the primaries. Okay. Is that clock not? What time is it? What? Okay, right. Okay, so uh, that's the end of the uh, celestial holography review. So the next thing I'm going to do is uh, discuss how you compute these uh, coefficients from symmetry. And then once we have these coefficients, we'll see how they uh, neatly encode the symmetries associated to soft theorems and momentum space. And then uh, with that, I'll explain how uh, those uh, organize into uh, W1 plus infinity algebra. And uh, the references for, for that part of the talk are uh, this paper that I wrote in March uh, with Alfredo Guevara, Mina Hemwich, and Andy Strominger, and then also Andy Strominger's paper from April. And in the last part, uh, we'll derive uh, the transformation of uh, massless particles and boost weights uh, under this uh, W1 plus infinity. And basically, you can follow a similar analysis as the one I'll present in this second section and see that the OPEs that are constrained uh, by Poincaré indeed are uh, automatically already automatically satisfied the action of this W1 plus infinity. Okay. So uh, as I said, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use Poincaré, but I have to tell you how Poincaré acts. Um, uh, on these celestial amplitudes. And so this was worked out by Steberger and Taylor in 2018. So Lorenz is easy. These are just standard uh, conformal generators, global conformal ones. And translations are more usual ones. And to figure out how those act, let me remind you of um, the pronunciation of the null momenta. And sort of by the same argument that I used to derive this fusion rule, you know, for, um, for these uh, operators, uh, this factor of omega is going to act in the boost weight state, space by shifting the dementia up by one. <coughs> And otherwise, it just multiplies by factors in C and C bar. And so these can be succinctly captured in one formula. It takes this form. We're here, coming in, a plus and minus one half, and they're labeling the modes under uh, the global conformal group. So they're the analogs of these labels and on the conformal group. So now what we're going to do is begin with the following options. So I just covered it up, but this, uh, so the m equals zero term 
is labeling the primary. And you can check that it is, in fact, of the form uh, that of a leading singular term that I said should arise in Z uh, using some, some basic knowledge about uh, collinear limits. Now, uh, the M greater than zero terms are the right moving conformal descendants. And uh, the reason why I need to include these is that uh, these translations, these factors of Z and Z bar here mean that the translations are actually mixing uh, primaries and descendants. So uh, I've included the right moving ones. It turns out I'm actually only going to need the ones that mix right moving uh, primaries and descendants. So that's why I haven't included the left moving ones and why it's consistent for us to just lead, analyze this leading term in one over Z by itself. Now, in principle, uh, this OP will include a sum over this parameter P, which let me remind you, is related, related to the spins this way. This is H3 and H3 bar. But since I'm going to use uh, uh, 4D Poincaré to constrain this OPE, and uh, the spin was uh, is, is helicity in four dimensions, Poincaré doesn't change helicity, so I can consistently look at just a single contribution at fixed P. Uh, and finally, uh, these guys uh, are the OP coefficients, and I've written them explicitly as depending on uh, H bar. Now, of course, they also depend on uh, the left moving weight H, but as I said, our goal is going to be to determine uh, the delta dependence of these OP co coefficients, but not the spin dependence. And so without loss of generality, I just write them as functions of the right moving weight and spin and just determine the dependence on the right on the right moving weight and this dependence on spin is left implicit. Okay. So that explains uh, why we're starting with the salt socks. And uh, as a warm up, we're going to recall uh, the derivation of uh, constraints that are associated uh, to this global conformal symmetry. So the ensemble as written is in fact already consistent with uh, the action of these two generators. And so all we need to do is now check the action of L bar one, which uh, let me remind you of its action. Takes this familiar form. Okay. So now, if we take that, and let's say on the left hand side, Well, as we know, L1 bar annihilates operators on the or at the origin, so it only acts on trivial on this first guy. So it's acting on the pair. We replace this with its OPE. And here we see that Z bar only appears in that power there. So we find this. Now, if we compare with the action uh, on the right hand side, of course, on the right hand side, it only acts on the operator. Inside uh, 
as we know, to evaluate this, we can pull this outside. Let's do bar M, L1 bar, three, zero. We calculate this. And plug it in, evaluate at zero, and you find this. And so now, if we compare uh, to compare these two sides, it's nice. So we see that there's a mismatch, but we can put it for a mismatch in the form that's written, but we can put it in the same form by taking this and shifting them to m plus one and uh, equating term by term. We find the following constraint on the operator. Uh, coefficients. And so you know that it's a recursion relation in M. This is what you expect because uh, this is just telling us that all the OP co coefficients of the descendants are written in terms of the primary. So now we can do the same thing for the translations. And so in particular, let's look at the action of this generator. So it's written over there. And this is the one that involves no powers of C to the bar. And so in particular, that means it doesn't mix primaries and descendants, and also it doesn't annihilate uh, an operator of the origin. So it's sort of easy to see that the type of recursion relation you get from this guy is instead involves recursion in the weights because uh, the translation shifts the weights and we find something that is fixed down, but involves recursion in the weights. Mm -hmm. So this is from acting on the first term. This is from acting on the second term. On the left-hand side, and this is from acting on the right-hand side. And then the last one we're going to use is this guy, which involves a single power of C bar. So that means it does mix the primaries and descendants. Um, but in fact, it mixes it just in the same way, basically, that this L1 bar did. And it also annihilates operators of the origin, similarly to this L1 bar. And so uh, the type of constraint uh, you get from this is involves a recursion in both H1, R, and N. Now, we can find another constraint for fixed M by combining uh, these two. And so in particular, you notice that this factor here appears here. So doing that, we find the second fixed M constraint. And this 
recursion relation, the, the two fixed M recursion relations, and this one uh, upon uh, sort of recognizing the correct arguments, you realize are the two recursion relations that define the Euler beta function. So that's just to say that the fixed M up to proportionality. This is proportional to a beta function. Like that. And now we can further use this recursion relation to fix the relative coefficients uh, between M, since that gives them one over M factorial. And then the final proportionality constant is precisely this factor that I told you I wasn't going to fix in the first place. Uh, and just for completeness, this Euler beta function can be written as the following computation of the other functions. So um, you can verify this formula by doing the, the sort of collinear limit analysis that I sketched at the beginning and carefully keeping track of everything. Uh, and there, then you find this uh, gamma is uh, you know, directly related to the uh, coupling constant uh, for the three-point interaction, the bulk three-point interaction that couples spin one, S2, and T plus one. Okay. So one of the things, uh, one of the first things to notice is uh, these uh, operator product coefficients have poles. In particular, when this first argument is a non-positive integer. I'll remind you, this is delta one times s one. Now, to understand the physical significance of these poles, let us consider um, the transformation of a function that admits a Laurent expansion. So. Uh, Laurent expansion around, let's say, uh, for here, uh, omega equals. Zero. So we can approximate this lower range by the Laurent expansion. And what we find is that powers of omega turn into simple poles in delta at integer values. And so, uh, and moreover, the residues, uh, residues of these poles are precisely uh, the uh, Laurent expansion uh, coefficients. So that means that this infinite tower of poles in uh, the operator uh, product expansion coefficient is capturing a series expansion in energy. And for scattering amplitudes, this series expansion in energy admits universal structure, which is described by the soft theorems. So specifically, uh, soft theorems can be interpreted as Born identities of infinite dimensional symmetries, where the soft particles uh, behave uh, like currents that generate this symmetry. So uh, now, We're going to focus on the soft behavior associated to the minimal coupling of a positive Felicity graviton to massless matter. And if we want, we can add some 2D phrasing of that in that in our ensembles, which are just erased. We're going to take the first particle to spin plus two and the spins of the second particle and the one appearing in the OP are the same, which in terms of this parameter P sets it equal to. So. And 
therefore we can use uh, the solution and this is the positive holicity graviton find uh, it's OPE. So I took the coupling constant to be the gravitational coupling constant. of soft graviton, you start expanding and the energy of that graviton, well, the amplitude develops a pole in that energy where the residue of the pole takes some universal form uh, where, uh, which is uh, this number, which is known as the soft factor, uh, multiplying the amplitude uh, without that soft graviton. And moreover, if you take this and parameterize it in terms of energies and points on the sphere, you find it takes this form. And if you write these particles in this Bruce Wade basis by the same argument I already gave, this omega is going to implement a shift of the dimension of the K this g of c and c bar is it a function of both c and c bar or only only c when delta one is equal to one when delta one is equal to one is it a function of z and z bar right. because naively would be you say it's like a current which is conserved current with the function of the c no so these they're uh while they are called currents they don't have the dimensions of currents so indeed yes and actually, I'm, I'm about to show you that it, it indeed does depend on C, both C and C bar. Yeah. Uh, there's actually uh, one way to see that it had to is I'm going to say a little bit more than tell you why it actually had to. So, right. So, okay. So now what we're going to do is actually take this limit and pick out the residue. And so if we take uh, this limit, well, uh, you'll notice that actually um, in this limit, only the term from uh, associated to the primary actually has a pole. And so uh, we kill actually the sum over the descendants and we find this and you'll notice that this is exactly the form of uh, this soft factor in the Bruce Wayne basis. And so in particular, this power of z-bar here is actually about telling you that there's non-trivial. Uh, this, this does have, depends on both. And, and also, yeah. Okay, so, um, so more generally, uh, the poles at uh, other values of delta are telling us 
about uh, the symmetries associated to subleading soft theorems. And to study these, we're going to uh, introduce uh, something so that we can study them all in one go. So here, we introduce this object. And where K takes on an values, and, um, and so this factor of epsilon is essentially picking out the residue of the pole. Now, uh, one of the first things to notice is that actually, whenever you take these, um, this, this residue, uh, the sum over descendants uh, always truncates. So here we saw it truncated to the first just the, first, just the primary, but more generally, it truncates to a finite number of descendants. And this suggests that actually these operators fall into finite dimensional representations of uh, the right moving global conformal symmetry, because these were just the right moving descendants, and admit the following mode expansion. Sage bar is the way. So, yes, for general K, it's non trivial. And uh, here, there's arbitrary Z dependence, which uh, is captured uh, by these, uh, what you might want to call chiral products. And now, uh, the algebra of the soft symmetries uh, can be uh, determined. Uh, by an operator product expansion uh, involving two of uh, these H's, which people are calling the soft gravitons. And so not you with the details, I'm going to sketch uh, how you get there. And so basic idea is we take our uh, minimal coupling um, operator product expansion, and now we further set the same side line too, so it describes uh, minimal coupling just between positive and spectrons. So we obtain some OPE between Two positive and the third one is affirmation. So then we take this conformally soft limit and we obtain an OPE between these conformally soft uh, gravitons. Now, uh, then you can do this mode expansion on the right and obtain. Um, what you might want to interpret as an operator product expansion among just these modes. And finally, if we interpret these as high roll currents, we can compute uh, all the way from there. And the result. At the end of the day, is that these um, right moving modes obey algebra, uh, which I'm not going to bother writing down because it's complicated. And the reason why it's definitely not useful to write down is that. In this April paper, uh, Andy Strominger noticed that if you make the following redefinition, <laughs> then 
then uh, this commutator takes a dramatically simple that is, uh, moreover, the recognizable. And so here, uh, P is equal to one, two, five halves, and so on. And this truncated uh, mode expansion and then implies that this mode number M is restricted uh, in this way. So without this mode uh, restriction, uh, this algebra is known as little w one plus infinity. And uh, with the mode restriction, it's the wedge set algebra of w one plus infinity. And so uh, let me just uh, tell you a couple uh, features of it. So uh, the first thing is that the P equals two, two mode generates an SL2R action on the other Ws, which transform like the nth mode of a primary of weight Q. Uh, P less than or equal to two, form a closed, Algebra. And the P equals five pass uh, generates uh, the rest of the infinite tower. And uh, so, as I described, these uh, modes are really telling you something about, or they're, they're encoding uh, the soft symmetries. And so, if you actually, it's up, yeah, the soft symmetries, and if you actually trace back uh, which one this one corresponded to, this was the it's, it's sub sub leading. A moment of space. Um, how much time? Uh, five minutes. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, just enough time for this final part, which is that now that we found this W1 plus infinity, uh, we'd like to know how it acts on uh, not just uh, the soft ground tones themselves, but the ma other massless particles. And so uh, the strategy to determine that is to compute an OPE between uh, these W uh, currents and one of these other uh, operators. And so there's sort of two options for how you can do this. You can either uh, compute uh, sort of uh, an operator product extension with this H and then relabel the modes, or it was also suggested uh, in this paper, that instead this mode relabeling could actually be implemented uh, by a light transformation in two dimensions. And so we're going to use that. And so in particular, I'm going to introduce uh, this object. There's normalization factors to get it correct. So let me draw you. So the weight of this guy is uh, four minus two Q plus epsilon, which uh, under that uh, definition, you'll notice is actually the K uh, from before. And the spin is two minus epsilon. So as we take epsilon to zero, this is really one of these conformally soft gravitons. And this light transformation is uh, 
where what it does is it takes an operator of weight or something that transforms like an operator of weight h h bar to something that transforms the operator of one minus h one minus h bar, and that means that this carries weight three minus q q. So here now we see that q is in fact labeling uh, the uh, right moving conformal weight of this operator. And so uh, you can compute uh, using our, our general solution. You can now compute an operator product expansion with this guy. And what you find is if you take uh, it with one of these massless particles, you find an operator product expansion where the thing that appears is this operator. Is it's loose weight shifted in this way. And finally, you can introduce uh, a conformally varying mode expansion. And so, of course, you can formally extract these modes by treating these as uh, independent complex variables and taking contours. And likewise, uh, to find an action on particles on, on, on these on these operators. So this is some complicated action, but you can actually show that if you act twice with two of these guys and then do it in the opposite form, uh, it uh, that net action make a difference. That net action is uh, essentially this. So that's just to say this these uh, really do generate the action of definitely one plus infinity on uh, the massless particles and. Uh, a final couple comments is that uh, some of these um, you can identify. So in particular, if you set Q equals to three paths, these are actually precisely the translation generators I wrote down about halfway through the talk. And likewise, if you set Q equals to two, these are 
the right moving mobile formal generators. And so now we've seen that basically what this restriction to the wedge is, is, is a restriction to the finite number of modes of these WQs that form a closed subalgebra with the um, uh, right moving global conformal symmetry. And uh, the very last thing is that you can take this very complicated action, run through the same analysis that I did with the Poincaré generators, and find that the solution to Poincaré additionally satisfies this action of W1 plus infinity. So that's it. Yep. Okay, just to complete the very last thing that you were writing. And what would be the V equals phi of generator? Oh, so it's uh, right. So I mean, this is essentially the global symmetry associated to the leading soft graviton theorem. This is the global symmetry associated to the subleading. And so the phi pax one is the one that generates the sub subleading one, right? But it's not something that you're used. I mean, like this one is already not something you're used to from a 2D conformal field theory, but I just told you what it was by like rewriting the momentum space action. And uh, likewise, the phi pax one is also exotic from the perspective of a 2D conformal field theory. Can you remind me something about uh, soft theorem? So there, there is the leading soft and sub leading are completely fixed. Those coefficients and then the sub sub leading are they, do they vary from theory to theory or are they completely fixed? Um, so you can show, so uh, let me just say we're working at tree level. You can basically show from uh, gauge invariance that the sub sub leading soft, uh, if you look at the sub sub leading limit, you uh, obtain some factorized. Form. So you might say it's sort of known in, in, in closed form. Uh, the rest of the infinite tower don't obey. There's some part you cannot determine. And actually, it's consistent with this story because effectively all we're learning about here is sort of the uh, leading singular terms in this coordinate Z. And those are precisely the things that you are have under control when you use 40 gauge invariants. There's actually, uh, maybe I should say also like, right, you can just ask from the perspective of, uh, From the perspective, you know, so I, I sort of told you that like it seems like for arbitrarily subleading orders, you have some symmetry. And you can ask actually just using 2D conformal field theory what you would expect. But really, what all I've told you about is I told you about leading singular terms. And so then the question you ask is when when is it the case, right, that singular terms uh, in an operator product expansion give you a word identity, right? And so, like a way to answer that is to consider some current. And um, write it right, as And uh, you can deform the contour then to uh, encircle all of these guys, but uh, only, uh, but okay, so let's say you deform the contour. You, you encircle all of these guys, but you also have in principle contribution from J at infinity. Now you can, uh, so we're gonna have, so, Uh, let's just look at the contribution from J at infinity. So if I, sorry, if I move them around each of these guys, then I can use the operator product expansion and, and the singular terms, I reproduce them. Now, you only find that those singular terms uniquely determine this, right? If there's no contribution from infinity. 
And essentially what you can show from the weight of uh, these WQs is that um, these guys are the ones that don't have contributions from infinity. And this is actually consistent with what you find by you know, brute force and, and scattering amplitudes. So these ones, the singular terms actually determine everything and the other ones they don't and scattering amplitudes also tell you that. Sorry, Monica, is, uh, yeah. I thought for, uh, for photons, the leading and subleading are universal. For gravitons, the leading and the subleading and the sub subleading are universal. That's, that, right. that's correct. So right now I'm doing, so right now I'm doing gravitons. And sorry, if you do this, if you do this weight counting thing for, for gluons, you also find that it truncates after the subleading and not the sub subleading. The weights are shifted a little bit because right now I'm looking at left and right moving weights, which depend on the step. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so two naive questions. Uh, the first one would be uh, Is there like a, so did this algebra show up as a surprise, W1 plus infinity, or is there some kind of underlying reason why it had to be this algebra and not? You know, so I think that appears in the context of a ADS three CFT two correspondence, or uh, uh, dimensions in certain uh, with supersymmetry, certain brain so, arrangements in PQ webs. <laughs> so that's also a place where I don't. know. So maybe here there's also some uh, fundamental reason why it should appear. Uh, so you know, at the moment, uh, that's not known. Uh, there are some people who are working on this from. Uh, a sort of uh, twister string perspective, and they they seem to say that yeah, you had to have this. But I I mean they, it's worked there. I haven't put their paper out, and so I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't fully understand. Yeah. And the the second comment is just that there's a very non-trivial isomorphism between this algebra and what's called the affine Yangian of GL one, referring to work of uh, Tsimbaliuk or Prochaska, um, and so. The, the, and the, the isomorphism is very, very non-trivial, but it gives a oh, sorry, amateur twister string. Yeah, but yeah, <laughs> uh, a perspective that might be also that might shed light on what I mean. The current structure is the presentation of the algebra is completely different. Just to, in terms of three Drinfeld currents, which have a completely different expansion, and yet it's isomorphic to the presentation you're giving. Yeah, that's really interesting. So, I don't know. Maybe it's uh, no. I mean, I mean, so. Uh, I am still quite a novice in uh, these W infinity algebras, and in particular, like I wrote for you some representation of it, and I I, don't, I would like to know if, like someone knows that from somewhere. It might be that it, we wrote it in a particularly dumb way, um, but If there are no more questions, let's thank Monica.